Well, I guess we're starting now. Um, just give me one second. All right. So thank you all for attending the second event of the Literary Imagination in Science, Technology, and Society uh, Winter Series. Uh, doc Professor Dr. Matthew Sample and I co-created the speaker's event um, maybe for us to collectively think about how the role of science and technology has impacted our everyday lives. And perhaps most importantly, we want you to think about the stories and narratives and imaginations that are already being told and whose stories are made less visible because of the dominant discourses that we do see. So of course that we can look at this space as another opportunity for academics to convene and engage theoretically with each other. Specifically because Matthew and I are trained as science and technology studies scholars, um, we have noticed this tendency where that specific field of scholars seem to fetishize particular narratives of sci-fi and they themselves begin writing their own sci-fi stories while using that dreadful word practitioner as a way to distinguish themselves from the conventional scholar. And so for those who have attended um, our first event with uh, Dr. Leah Ceccarelli, you notice that she interrogated how scientists embrace words like the endless frontier and discovery. And so I bring this up because we might even think of academics kind of using that discovery language to talk about other kinds of narratives that they take for their own work. So you can think about other similar concepts like futurity, world-making imagination. And the intervention that we are hoping to make is like, there are already writers who have actively been doing this kind of work at least since the 50s and 60s. And so we want to think of this space as something other than a competing imagination site. So academics are always kind of trying to argue with each other about whose perspective and whose critical scholarship are better. But here we're wanting to include poets and literary authors in this kind of space. So that's the introduction. Um, a quick note on questions. So of course, as you may all know, after the uh, reading and discussion, there, are, there will be time for questions and answers. And this is how we would like to see it shape. Um, depending on the nature of the questions, please send them to me. And if I see re repetition or common themes, I'll synthesize it. And if there's a unique case in which there's a, a pretty unique question, then maybe we'll ask you to unmute yourselves and ask Asako directly. Okay. So Asako Sarazawa is the author of Inheritors. And she is the winner of the 2021 Penn Open Book Award and the Story Prize Spotlight Award. And Inheritors has also been listed, long listed for the Penn Robert W. Bingham Prize and the Massachusetts Book Award. She's a graduate of Tufts University, Brown University and Emerson College. And she has also received two O. Henry Prizes, a Pushcart Prize, a Rona, Rona Jaw Foundation Writers Award, as well as a fellowship from the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, McDowell and elsewhere. She's also a native of Japan and is currently living in Boston, USA where she and I met and I kind of say that she's my neighbor even though we live very far away from each other. Um, translations of the inheritors are forthcoming in Spanish and Korean. And so I will turn it over to Asako. Well, thank you so much for um, having me, Matthew and Anna and um, Sels. Um, I am going to um, read a couple of uh, short segments from Inheritors. Um, here's the book. Um, and let's see, the first one um, is going to be accompanied by um, a, a video, a short video. And it's a public domain footage of 1930s and 1940s Japan. And um, there'll be images of um, the aftermath of the firebombing of Tokyo, but there's nothing gruesome. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, and let's see, uh, what else do you have to know? Um, okay, so the story is told as a one-sided interview where you see or hear um, the interviewee's um, answer, but not the interviewer's questions. Um, and the narrator is a um, old Japanese woman who has come to talk about her wartime experiences um, with these American historians who are soliciting particular testimonies, um, mainly for legal justice. 
Um, the story is set in 1991, um, and so that's 46 years after the Second World War, and a couple of years after the death of the Showa Emperor, who presided over 20th century um, wars. Okay, so I am going to share my screen. Let's see. Okay. Okay, Willow Run. Do you know Willow Run? Yes, Willow as in the tree, run as in the verb. Of course, I had no idea what it meant then or what he, the soldier, meant by it. But I like the sound, Willow Run, like something wispy, something escaping. Looking back, I have to laugh, but at the time I'd repeat the word so cumbersome on my tongue. Many women recited the sutras, but in that situation, I'm sorry, was there some way you wanted me to begin? I was born in the first year of Taisho, that's right, 1912. Of course, as a Japanese, I wonder if nuances aren't lost when accounting in the Western way. For example, unlike Meiji people like our parents, we Taisho people were very open to the Western world. Have you heard of Moga or Modangaru? As a girl, I thought we were quite modern, quite sophisticated. I'll be 79 in October. Yes, my husband passed on last year, which is why I decided to come. But please, as I mentioned on the telephone, my son, he's a scholar. I don't want him impl implicated. You explained very well your legal ambitions, but are you sure my name won't? No, no, I'm prepared to talk. It's just that, well, if I had half your courage, a young woman like yourself coming all this way from America, you mentioned your parents are Korean? Then I understand your interest. But is your cameraman a historian too? Why an American man would be interested in? But I'm sorry, it must be my nerves chatting away like this. Not that people don't come forward. Someone always comes forward, don't they? And now with our Showa emperor passed and everybody reflecting on that war. You see, your call for testimonies. It was the first time I saw anybody soliciting that story. Oh dear, the hand towel. No, no, it's all right. Is the camera still? At the time of surrender, my husband and I were already in O City. We'd fled Tokyo after we lost our son. Oh no, we only had one biological child. After the war, we adopted our son. Yes, the scholar, though we didn't tell him that about his adoption. After all, our child, he was 15. Why he wasn't in his room that night. Yes, the March air raid. Looking back, I see how unprepared we were. We'd gotten used to the false alarms. All we'd seen was the glow of distant flashes. But that night, we hardly had a minute before we heard the whistling. Back then, we slept in our clothes, so all we had to do was grab our emergency bags and put on our silly hoods. Oh, they were just padded pieces of cloth, another thing our government cooked up. Still, we put them on, you know, half of us running around with our hoods on fire. We ran and ran, our houses shooting into flames. Until then, I never knew fire could be so loud, crashing about like that. And the heat, it was like a rubber mask. We couldn't breathe or see. All we could do was run from street corner to street corner, smoke rolling in from every side, shadows appearing and disappearing, sometimes knocked away like bowling pins. Everywhere, families were calling each other, and one mother, I'll never forget her, came barging past with a baby strapped to her back. She was so determined, you know, but that poor baby, its little head was knocked back and running like an egg. There were so many lost children, we tried to take them with us, but they clung to the spots where they thought their parents would come back for them. We eventually found a shelter, but the next morning, everything was in piles. Even the air was scorched, embers floating like fireflies, and the bodies, you know. They were sprawled every which way, clogging the ditches, 
cluttering the streets. And all I could think was whether Seiji, our son, had taken his emergency bag or whether, whether I'd seen it at the entrance. Now there's little to remind us of that time, but it's the body that remembers. Some people can't stand the sound of fireworks. For myself, it's the smell of roasting meat. Right, so I'll stop here, but basically the, um, let me see, let me just stop sharing. Okay. Um, so basically the, the, the story goes on like this and you start to see why this woman is telling um, her story and what's at stake, um, not just for her, but for the interviewer as well. And, um, you know, as this, the space of this, the, the, the testimony turns into this battleground where, you know, the two people are sort of battling for this, for the narrative that they're gonna tell, um, you know, you can kind of start to see the, the power struggle that they're locked in um and and you know both parties trying to control uh, the narrative of this history um so that's that one and then <clears throat> let me see sorry i have a little frog in my throat <clears throat> okay so the second piece i'm going to read from is um <clears throat> sorry um it's called train to harbin um, and it's it's written in a kind it's it's a different structure. It's kind of written in an elliptical memory structure, where the narrative's um, consciousness sort of circles around the spoke of this memory. He's wary of of remembering, like he doesn't want to remember it, um, but is sort of tethered to, um, and keeps sort of compulsively returning to it. You know, and um, so I'm gonna so it's kind of written in this way that's hard to read. Um, but I'm going to read from parts of the beginning, which I've kind of streamlined and stitched together, but hopefully um, you'll get a sense of it. Um, the only thing you probably need to know is that the I is a first person um, narrator. He's a research Japanese research doctor who was um, specially deployed to China by the Japanese military um, during the Second World War. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so train to Harbin. Um, I once met a man on the train to Harbin. He was my age, just past his prime, hair starting to grease and thin, in a way one might have thought passably distinguished in another context, in another era, where he might have settled, reconciled to finishing out his long career predictably. But it was 1939, war had officially broken out between China and Japan, and like all of us on that train, he too had chosen to take the bait, that one last bite before acquiescing to life's steady decline. You see, for us university doctors, it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. We all knew it, especially back then. Two nights and three days from Wonsan to Harbin, the train cluttered on, the lush greenery interrupted by trucks and depots manned my soldiers in military khaki. Despite the inspections and unexplained transfers, this man I shall call S remained impassive, shadowed by a dusky light that had nothing to do with the time of day or the dimness of the car's interior. He sat leaning against the window pane, face set impervious to the din around him. Later, I would come to recognize this posture of self recrimination But at the time I had barely recovered from my initial journey from Niigata to Wonsan across the sea of Japan. And I was in a contemplative mood myself, in no condition to pause over the state of others, much as engage with my colleagues who by now had begun drinking in earnest, liquor still being plentiful then, oiling even the most reticence of tongues. So I excused myself and must have promptly nodded off for the next moment it was dawn, the day just beginning to break the length of the train still shrouded in sleep. I was the only one awake, the only one woken by the sudden secession of rhythm, which drew me to the window, still dark except for my reflection superimposed on it. We had apparently stopped for cargo, the faint scuffling I could hear revealing a truck ringed by soldiers, their outlines camouflaged against the paling horizon. Later, I would learn the significance of this stop, but for the moment, the indistinct scene strained my eyes, and I pulled back, hoping to rest for another hour. 
40 years later, the scene returns to me with a crispness that seems almost specious when so much else has faded or disappeared. Perhaps it is simply the mind, which in its inability to accept a fact, returns to it, sharpening the details, resolving the image, searching for an explanation that the mind, with its slippery grasp on causality, will never be able to find. Most days I'm spared by the habits of routine, but when the air darkens like this, turning the windows inward and truncating the afternoon, the present recedes. If hindsight were less truculent, I might have long ago been granted the famed view of belated clarity that might have illuminated the exact steps that led me into the fog of my actions. But hindsight has not offered me this view, my options and choices as elusive now as they had been then. After all, it was war, an inexcusable logic, but also a fact. We adapted to the reality over which we felt we had no control. Two hours later, we pulled into Harbin, our emperor's celebrated new acquisition. So I'm gonna skip ahead um, just a bit. From Harbin, the doctors are taken south to a place called Pingfan, where their research facility is located. And they gradually discover um, the full scope of their assignment, which involves what they call maruta. Maruta in Japanese means log, you know, like a lumber log. Um, Pink Fan from the start was remarkable. Its imposing structure looming in calculated isolation, its vast grounds secured by high voltage walls, its four corners staked with watchtowers overlooking its four gates armed with guards whose shouts were regularly drowned out by the clatter of surveillance planes circling the facility. Approaching them for the first time in jostling trucks, we watched the walls of the compound unroll endlessly before us each additional meter contracting our nerves so that our faces, initially loose with excitement, began to tighten, eliciting a lustrous laugh from our young guide, who turned to remark, of course, we don't bear the emperor, emperor's emblem here. Sure enough, when we stopped for authorization at the gate, we saw that the walls were indeed ungraced. In a world where even our souls were expected to bear the mark of the emperor, the absence was terrifying. And perhaps this was when I saw Pink Fan, its forbidding grandeur, cloaked by its unmarked walls, presaging what it was capable of. By then it was clear that the warning emanating from it made no exceptions, even as it opened its gates and saluted us in. All told, I spent 24 months in Pink Fan. Officially, we were the Boe Kikusibu, the anti-epidemic uh, water sanitation unit, Unit 731, a defensive research unit. Materially, Ping Fan span spanned 300 hectares, its fertile land dappled with forests and meadows, its innumerable structures, headquarters, labs, dorms, airfields, greenhouses, pool, luxuriously accommodated within its fold. Locally, we were known as a lumber mill, a pair of industrial chimneys continually emptying into the impending sky. I do not know who came up with the term Marta. Possibly its usage preceded us. The first time we saw them, we were in the hospital ward where they looked like any patient, intubated under clean sheets changed daily. The second time we saw them, it was at the prison ward where they looked like any prisoners, uniformed and wary. Both times, I remember the hush that fell over us as we registered exactly what we were being shown before we were briskly ushered away. By the time we were given full reign over our research, we were using the term, counting up the beds, tallying amaruta in preparation for our next delivery. Indeed, I believe it was a cargo transfer that I witnessed that morning on the train to Harbin. I was asked to inspect such a cargo just once. Woken abruptly, I was summoned by an officer waiting in an idling jeep. Throughout the ride, I was bleary, my mind caught me with sleep. And once I gleaned the purpose of the trip, a preliminary health scan, I shut out the chatter and arrived unprepared for the secluded station. The small squadron of military guards patrolling the length of the curtain train. 
The cargo's white tarp peeled back to reveal 12 prisoners strapped to planks and gagged by le leather bits. My first reaction was morbid fascination, my mind unable to resolve the image of these people packed like this. And the term Marta acquired a horrific appropriateness that struck a nerve. I began to laugh, a sputtering sound that elicited a disapproving glance from the officer who pressed me forward. How they managed to survive, I could not imagine. Trembling with exhaustion, they lay in their thin prisoner's clothes, wet and stinking of their own unirrigated waste, until one by one they were unfastened, forced to stand, their movements minced by the shackles that still bound their hands and feet. No one protested, the only shouts coming from the guards as they stripped and prodded them, the, the tips of their knives shredding their garments, exposing them first to the cold, then to the water, as a pair of soldiers hosed them down. Had I been able to, I would have abandoned my post, and perhaps I made as if to do so. For the officer gripped my arm, his placid face nicked by repulsion, though it was unclear for whom or what. As the water dripped away and the marita were toweled off, I was led to the nearest plank, where four women, now manacled together, sat shivering. They were all in their twenties and thirties, their eyes black with recrimination, and their chattering bodies so violently pimpled by the cold, I could hardly palpate them. The second plank was an all-male group, each man, wiry with work, irradiated by a humiliation so primal, my hands began to shake. The third and final plank was a mixed group, perhaps a family. One woman grew so agitated by my attempts to minister to a limp girl, that I barely registered the man, pulled from the train and added to the cargo. This new prisoner was my age, in good health and spirited enough to have risked the curtains to spy from the, uh, from the train window. He was brought to me to be tranquilized, and though I must have complied, I remember nothing else. Only the leering heat of the soldiers snapped to attention behind me, and then later the vague relief that flooded me with the next day I stepped into my ward and did not recognize a single face. Lumber mills? I don't believe anyone was so naive. So that is the reading. And so I think before um, we turn to the conversation part, um, I thought maybe I'll just say very briefly, just touch on a couple of um, general ways that um, science and technology crept into the book. Um, Okay, so <clears throat> first, I don't think there's any way to write about um, war and empire, so imperial and colonial history, without acknowledging and registering on the page the instrumentality of science and technology to warfare and the imperial and colonial enterprise, um, and what scientific and technological advancements have meant in terms of conquest and, uh, and, the, and the subjugation and control of um, others. Um, others with a capital O. Um, World War II, in my mind, um, is, uh, was a formative war for many reasons, but one of the things that gave it its character, you know, like the Holocaust and the atomic bombings, but also the aerial bombings, um, has to do with what these advancements made possible. Um, for example, in terms of the, you know, the system, systematic uh, scope and scale of the destruction, um, the new distance enabled um, in combat, and the blurring of the home front and the battlefield, the civilian and the um, enemy soldier and the distinction between them sort of getting disintegrating. <clears throat> and related to this um, is science and technology's instrumentality also to nation building and nationalism, which in my mind is at the root of the whole imperial and colonial enterprise. Um, and I don't mean just in terms of, you know, border control and um, territorial uh, defense and resource security, um, I mean, in terms of creating and managing national subjects, um, you know, like through uh, communication and administrative technologies, medical and um, agricultural science, um, all of it, um, which are uh, vital to maintaining and sustaining not just state power, um, but the health of the citizens and the national body. Um, and of course, science and technology are central to authoritarian states and their dream of centralization and fascist states and their dream of utopia. Um, 
The last thing I'll say is about the language of science and technology. And, I, and I'm gonna, this is a little bit different than how you were talking about it earlier. Um, but you know, the language of science and technology um, and its role in knowledge production. Um, so knowledge building, which is central to all these sort of aspects. And as far as I know, the 17th century enlightenment project was pivotal to this um, with its privileging of you know, um, empirical science, instrumental reason, linearity and rationality over faith and mysticism, facts over fiction, and a notion of progress as a standard measure of um, civilization, of the degree of civilization. Um, and all of this was to get humanity basically out of the dark ages into a better, happier one. Um, and, it, and, you know, to my mind, it gave science and technology and the language of science and technology with its assumed objectivity and truth claims, um, its power and authority and its social and political cachet. Um, so on the bright side, we have modern medicine, organized and regulated societies, disciplined disciplines in the hard and soft sciences, smartphones, you know, on the, on the flip side, um, you know, it's not hard to see how this divided the world into the primitive and the enlightened, um, the backward and the advanced, um, justifying civilizing missions into the dark continent um, and other dark corners of the world. So to my mind, um, imperialism and colonialism works through the assertion um, and maintenance of power differentials that are justified by essentialized difference, um, whether that's gender, class, race, sexuality, ethnicity, um, the list goes on. Um, and beyond ships and weapons and mapping devices, um, science and technology, its language and ideals are instrumental to creating and asserting difference, you know, unequal difference. And to me, World War II is one logical uh, culmination of the trajectory that the Enlightenment project set into motion. So anyway, and, I, and Matthew, um, and I'm sure many of you out there are much more quick to talk about all this than me, but these are some of the things that I was constantly reminded of while researching for this book. And it's the reason why I wrote this book um, in hybrid form as an interconnected story collection rather than a novel um, and using a nonlinear structure that's mosaic and kaleidoscopic to narrativize this particular history. Um, the book begins with an epigraph that has to do with the catastrophic irony of the Enlightenment project. Um, and this theme is carried through the stories and the generations of the family central to the book. And I'm just gonna show you the family tree. So basically it's, it's like that. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and it starts with the first male progenitor who is um, born in 1868 um, which is a pivotal year in Japanese history, and it marks, this, marks the start of Japan's nationalization and empire building. And the book ends with a couple of stories set in the near future, where I speculate on the world's trajectory if we stay on course. And I basically wanted to put um, World War II into its larger context. And it's basically a kind of counter narrative um, to the various master narratives um, not just American European, but Japanese and Asian too, around this history. Um, the challenge is really to keep these layers, the macro and the micro, the structural and the personal, the facts and the affect. Um, oh, did something happen? Oh, <laughs> you shared the thing. Okay. Um, so to, to keep all of these things um, together, you know, um, and not sort of privileging one, uh, the personal, for example, which is usually a case in fiction over the, the um, structural, for example, um, it's a little bit different in literary fiction than science fiction, but that's basically the, the idea of the book. Okay, so I think that's it for me. Um, so Matthew had just briefly Flash the timeline that Asako had shared. Um, it's the first, or I, maybe not the first page, but it's one of the introductory things. If for those who haven't read it, it's um, the the stories span with about 150 years, and they're not in linear order, as Asako said. And so I found that it was really helpful to actually look at the the family tree, and then looking below with the the story titles, they give. Asako provided the years and so it's actually kind of fun to do the math and see how how the ordering went so that's always the thing that I'm interested in if 
if the stories tell a robust story, but in perhaps not in the most linear way, how do these themes kind of fit together? And I think, as you were saying, that there are prescient and fragmentation, but they all go together. And mm -hmm. so I, I bring this up because I want to be clear to the audience members who have not read the story that um, it's, don't expect like a conventional novel because you actually there should be some work to work out the um, the details and how the tonal shifts do happen. I think it was a really wonderful read for me. And um, and Asako and I have talked about some similar themes on my podcast, liter critical mm -hmm. literary consumption. But um, because I'm Matthew and I kind of envisioned the space to be what what differences are there in the minds of academics, specifically science and technology studies scholars who kind of they want to be critical, but they still continue to fetishize certain aspects of science and technology. And I think they think of more extravagant ways in doing their kind of analysis and research. So of course you would immediately think of Elon Musk. You know, it's very easy to criticize Elon Musk, but I think with Asako, your work, and then if, even if you go into doing the comparative work with Kazu Ishiguro, there's a sense of dread, but also like there's this kind of this reluctant acceptance that things have already been impacted by our lives. And maybe there's no, there's no real need to fetishize science and technology, but just how do you live with it and continue to push back against it? I think that's something that I see lacking in a lot of scholarship that should be critical, but maybe not to my happiness or I don't know. So, I, so you're the first author, I guess, in the, in the lecture series. And some of the things that you were saying actually mirrors um, Leah Ceccarelli. And I know the video is not yet up, but she talks a lot about this kind of mentality of discovery and, and that we continue, we continue to kind of use that same language from the past to echo future aspirations. And so I wonder when, when, you're, when you're going through this storytelling of science and technology as part of an empire, global, not even just national or nation state mm -hmm. building, but it's a global enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, what were some of the, maybe some of the theories if you read it that you were thinking about as you, because the scholar comes up quite often in your stories, especially I'm thinking of Luna and even in Willow Run, um, is it the, the testimonial? She, she mentions a son who's going to school, mm -hmm. but the idea of a scholar comes up often in your, in your stories. Um, and, and especially studying, thinking about your MFA to MA program, you studied some, I'm sure you've had to read some sort of theories, right? Involving craft, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. like maybe just kind of general social theory. So like, what, what were the um, texts that you wanted to respond to or you were thinking about as you were crafting this kind of big, big gener intergenerational stories? Well, I think the, the, the scholar part, I mean, this is interesting because I think that so much of, um, well, first of all, the book is sort of a counter narrative to a lot of these official master narratives, you know, um, whether that's like a political kind that the state or the government uses to tell this history for their own gains, you know, um, or whether it's in history books, like military history or something where they use this type of, um, objective language, which I associate with the language of science and, and, and technology, um, where there, you know, where facts and data and things like that are grounding the truth um, statements in the in the book, you know, and so, um, and, and there's a lot of different ways that this works in terms of creating, like, abstracting the human element from um, the, what they're talking about, you know, and so the book was sort of like, um, on the one hand, kind of a response to that kind of um, narrativizing of this history. Um, World War II continues to be this contentious history that is used often in Asia, um, but I think it's still here as well, you know, in various ways. Um, and, you know, it has a lot to do with nation building, um, especially in Asia, and also like this kind of geopolitical, um, um, issues that are going on, ongoing, you know, um, and, and it's used to justify um, nationalistic, uh, to nationalize countries, especially when it's going through some distress. 
And so it has a lot of different functions. And, you know, when I was doing some, when I was doing the research for the book, I think that's one thing that was emphasized to me, like the uses of this kind, you know, how this narrative is written and, and how it was used. I think on the other hand, you know, um, I started thinking about this. My background is, you know, I had um, a background in literary studies um, with a post-colonial focus. And so, but my, my field of study had nothing to do with um, Japan or Asia. Um, you know, it was just kind of a general um, overview of um, post-colonial literature with some um, theory, often Marxist theories, um, and a lot of like um, social theories as well. And so all those kinds of larger um, issues, you know, of power really, you know, and how, um, how these like colonial and imperial enterprises like functioned or worked you know, and how um, expansion happened and how um, colonies were maintained, um, just different things like that. And how it was represented in literature was something that was kind of part of my thinking, you know, that I brought that. And you can't, you know, just um, transpose the, those things onto a, the Asian context. Um, but it was really helpful to me to sort of think through um, some of these larger issues, you know. And so that was sort of, in the background as well and then it was sort of like um trying to kind of put all of these things together i think um does that sort of answer your question i feel like i'm rambling <laughs> you're not rambling at all it's, um because i always think of like the two culture paradigm um, you know like the science and art and it, I, th I thought like we were kind of already collapsed that, but I feel like it always comes back like this kind of social science versus the arts. And then if the yeah. idea is to build narratives, I think like, well, we can actually move past that, but I feel like we haven't exactly. And mm -hmm. so I only bring up this kind of textual discourse because um, I, I, don't, I don't actually see a way that scholarship in ST, and specifically in the SDS scholarship, that's kind of like my main, mm -hmm. my maybe my main critiques in academia. It's like they kind of, bar, they keep retooling things from the past, let's just say from the 70s. And, and there's not a very strong post-colonial critique in a lot of the, their scholarship, or at least they kind of forget the stories that you're kind of trying to tell through literary fiction. But I, there's something like they're stuck in this kind of captivating the technocratic voices and, and that the way I want to focus some of the narrative on science and technology is can we just kind of look at the banality of, of those forces and then maybe that mm -hmm. creates more of a more robust, you know, a robust mm -hmm. consideration of the possibilities, even if it's science and technology could still be bad. Well, what could we do if we're already living in that kind of society that, have, that has embraced it? Um, I, I mean, should do you think... Oh, I'm sorry. I should have oh, no. to the audience. Please, if you have questions um, about the book in general, um, the readings or kind of just the overall discussion and the themes of the um, talk, please write me, write to me, and then we'll go from there. I mean, I, you know, it, it's interesting because I think that but what we, what you're reminding me of is this sort of divide between fiction and nonfiction or fiction and fact that's still reinforced. And I mean, part of it feels like, you know, with science and technology, you know, that truth claim is so important, you know, that that claims to objectivity, which then allows it to claim as this kind of true, you know, the, the truth value of it, you know. And it seems to me that that's, I mean, I don't know where we go from there, you know, like just if you saw that as narrative, as some type of fiction, you know, um, which I think a lot of fiction tries to break down. And I think especially these days, you know, I think fiction tries to do that, whether in terms of like historical fiction that has this historical component or, you know, um, I don't know so much about sci-fi, um, but, you know, it goes the other way too, where, you um, fiction or or the arts or or cultural material or any of these things also use that kind of language you know sub, the, the supplement supplementing the text with 
um, facts and data and maps and all of these things to give it that kind of authority, you know? And so um, I don't know, I mean, if you break that down, I mean, can you break that down? I don't know, you know? And I feel like that's, that, that privileging has been with us for so long, you know? And I mean, my book is sort of trying to counter that sort of understanding, that linear logic, that kind of instrumental rationality, you know, um, and trying to engage with how this type of language is used and for what effect, you know, and for what consequence on a human level, really, you know. Oh, you're muted. Hello, um, Anna has called on me to ask a question. Oh. So um, in Train to Harbin, the, the second reading, um, many of the features of Ping Fang were about bioweapons research, vivisection on humans, all of these things um, are a matter of sort of historical record. I mean, by mm -hmm. now it seems like they're sort of, they've gained the, gained the status of facts. So um, in many ways, if you treat this as a resource for understanding science and technology. Um, you can use it in a robust empirical way. You can say, you know, this is a case where we can extrapolate, you know, what does this tell us about the violent nature of science and tech in empire and in state building. Um, but in the, the one of your later stories in the collection, the garden is set in the future. And um, for people who haven't read the book, it involves um, a new digital platform called The Garden, and this has sort of an ambivalent character, uh, not to spoil it too much. So I'm curious if you could maybe walk us through how you constructed these two parts, considering that one is a matter of sort of, uh, you could actually do archival research on it or factual research, and the other is in the future. So it's it's not something that you could, um, you know, you have to construct it in your own imagination in a sense. Um, but obviously you had inspirations in real life and texts you were reading. So um, could you say a little bit about the, the research and, and inspiration process for these two types of, of stories, especially the latter one? Okay, so I think in terms of Train to Harbin, I mean, at the time when I wrote, when I was writing the, the story, there was actually not much that was available to me in terms of archival uh, material. And um, it's, it's as, as the internet kind of grew and more material, I think became declassified as well as just like being available online. Um, I was able to get some of these details, but I think the tricky thing about this is that, you know, all of these um, facts has to be evaluated, you know, because um, there are so many conflicting and, and speculative elements to what this place looked like even, um, what went on in this place, all of these kinds of things. And um, if you're looking at numbers, you know, like um, how, many, there, how many casualties there were, how many victims there were, all of these things, um, there are so many competing um, narratives and also just like numbers around this you know some people say a certain number or figure and then somebody says something that's exponentially bigger or smaller you know and um, it depends on how they're counting what they're in you know including all of this stuff and so one of the challenges so one of the reasons why the um that story was written in this elliptical style is to sort of you know give it that context you know because essentially this is a character who is putting himself on trial and so in a way he's putting these figures and reasoning and rationality and justifications on trial, you know, to himself, you know, because essentially um, this is not something that um, was ever, be it never became a trial, like in real life, you know, um, it should have been treated as a war crime, but, you know, there was a lot of complications around that. And so um, it's embedded within this kind of structure, because I see the structure and form as like the, the interface, you know, um, into these and, and, and a way to kind of bring together all of these different um, fields and disciplinary layers into the text, you know. Um, so there's a lot of questioning of that kind of um, what that archive means, you know, and how it's used and how, I mean, we have to kind of put those things on trial. You know, especially if you are considering 
ethical questions, you know, and um, and part of this, it's kind of interesting because Japan also stands at this weird um, juncture between being a victim and and being the perpetrator, you know, so being sort of colonized in this sort of you know way that a lot of Asia Asia was, um, but also it was an imperial power. So it stands at this strange juncture and. Um, and I think this complicates that whole dynamic, you know, and so that story sort of is trying to bring together all of these elements um, to talk about the complexities of this kind of narrative. On the other hand, the um, garden and, and the garden actually is a um, image or motif in the entire collection. It reappears in different ways, like agriculture um, as a particular, um, I guess, figure you know in the in the book um and that one partially you know i think it was looking at the way the world is going um and sort of seeing the roots of all of this stuff that we're talking about um in the world you know so i was thinking sort of being here i mean it was written right before the pandemic <laughs> And, you know, and, and other things, but it, it kind of looks at those things because it seems like it's a logical sort of conclusion or, or trajectory out of the whole World War II and previous, um, you know, because we're still privileging things like science and technology and, you know, facts and all of these things at the expense of what, you know, um, and what are we not looking at here, you know, um, and so, you know, here is a world in which um, the spheres have changed. So war is no longer really fought on a material plane. It's kind of gone online, um, you know, and so there's a virtual component to this where, you know, whereas in the past, there wasn't that kind of thing. I mean, even in Train to Harbin, I think that there are different layers of um, realities, you know, so there's a consciousness layer, there's trying to be this other um, objective reality layer that's supposed to be there, but is kind of murky, you know, I think in this one, the layers are slightly shifted into a different um, way. And so, so that story tries to bring together um, other elements that have introduced um, with technological and scientific advancements, you know, because I think that that really marks the way that we create and experience our own realities, you know, um, whether it's individually or collectively. I don't know, <laughs> does that sort of answer your question, Matthew? I hope so. Uh, I'm going to unmute Shweta Krishnan. Um, they have a very interesting question specifically about some of your, uh, Luna, so I will oh. mute you. Hi, thank you so much for the reading and your talk. I really enjoyed reading this book. Um, oh, good, thank you so much. Uh, I'm uh, a student of anthropology and I'm interested in translation geography. So I think my question is sort of um, coming from there. So I think one of the things that I really enjoyed is um, Luna, I think sort of becomes a character that moves through space quite a lot in the book. And um, because I really enjoyed reading her as a character and she crops up in multiple spaces, she's a child, there's her story and then she's a mother. And um, so it kind of made me think about the place from which you're telling the story in multiple places. And so some of the earlier stories, um, the stories, um, before Luna's father unfold in Japan and then Luna's father and Luna's story end up being bicontinental. And then the stories of the future are sort of imagined from um, the US where she migrates to and then her family lives in. So I was actually curious if the choice of geography was also a comment on both um, the flow of imperialism but also the kind of technological um, you know, where, where the capitalist flows are and where technology has come up or where it can, um, because there was a small part of me that wondered what it would be like to imagine a future from, say, Japan or, you know, even Korea because of Luna's father's um, sort of, you know, his own interest in his origins more than anything else. So, yeah, so that was my question. <laughs> well, this, this is a great question. Um, and, 
You know, I'm glad that you're asking it because actually this book is um, the first book in a tetralogy or quartet. Yeah. Um, and so you're actually going to get some of those perspectives um, in the next three books. Um, and so that's really exciting that that you were picking up on all that and like I'm you know, very wondering excited about... to hear that I should say okay sorry don't mean to interrupt you but just so excited but yeah and so so I'm, I'm really I'm glad that you feel that way and um yeah because that was one of the the issues and and you know part of why it was written as this kind of interconnected stories and and having this sort of chain of stories that were mobile you know because I was also thinking about um having you know, reading these stories in clusters, you know, so like you can take all the women characters or like you were saying, you know, um, Luna as a character and looking at the ones that where she appears um, or, you know, looking at the children narratives or, or this kind of like configuration that should show other aspects of, um, create other uh, clusters of perspectives, you know, that are contrasting, but also maybe reinforcing. Um, but the other thing about the the chain, the mosaic situation is that, you know, it preserves the, the white space between the stories in my mind. And what this sort of allows, I thought, um, would be to um, allow other um, to allow other stories. Um, so because, you know, it all works by omission. You know, if you try to, to create um, a narrative, you know, there's so many things that you have to omit to create a streamlined thing. Um, and even in a novel where, you know, you are writing um, disparate point, you know, like many points of views that are revolving, there's this kind of um, cohesiveness that comes into play. And I really didn't want that to be the case, partially because I wanted to um, create that sense um, make it clear that there are omissions and that this is one family, but even within that family, um, you know, it, there are omissions and there are graftings and there are um, fragmentation. And um, I think one thing, because I'm writing as a Japanese person um, about this history, I also felt that, um, you know, I think we need more stories from the, the, the Asian post-colonial um, countries, for example, or just voices, you know, and because um, I don't want to make it into a national thing, but, but um, you know, other voices. And then I feel like, um, you know, the spaces are meant to kind of, in my mind, I wanted it to be invitational so that other people can add these stories because I wasn't sure, you know, what my position might be. I mean, this is an ongoing question I have, you know, like, um, at some point, I think, I mean, I don't, I think that, you know, writers can write from any perspective that they want to, if they can find a way to do it responsibly. And that's another whole other question. Um, but I also feel that if there are, um, if there aren't that many uh, voices available, I don't know that I felt comfortable um, trying to write from these other perspectives too. I mean, not Japan, but like I was thinking particularly about the Korean perspective, for example, right. you know, um, and yet history is so enmeshed. I mean, I don't think you can extricate that and be like, oh, I'm just gonna write from the Japanese perspective or because I live here, I'm gonna write from the American perspective. You know, like I think that it's too enmeshed um, no matter what. And so I felt that I wanted to do that, but at the same time, you know, this is the problem with Orientalism, you know, like where, um, you know, there's a whole um, body of knowledge or discourse that uh, characterizes a certain region in a certain kind of way. And um, there are lots of, issues with that. But I think one of the things about Orientalism is that uh, it doesn't allow space for other voices. I mean, part of the, the problem with Orientalism, um, besides the, the racist elements, I think it's that, um, you know, there are no, there's very little other narratives from other points of view, you know, that is permitted in it. Um, and that's one of the biggest problems. So all of these things were kind of swirling. And so when I wrote this book, I mean, I chose this structure and this, this um, form, um, but then I realized um, that at some point that I need to look at um, other, 
uh, se segments of it, you know, like this book doesn't talk about the atomic bombing and atomic history, which I think is huge. It doesn't talk about um, colonization of Korea, you know, um, Japanese colonialism in Korea. And, and that's something that I need, you know, that's going to be addressed later on. Um, and so, you you know, you'll, you'll see like the bigger um, structure or I guess the bigger whole. Um, and even then it wouldn't be a whole. <laughs> But anyway, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think what I really enjoyed is how disjointed the stories are and how they don't try to get to a hole, but they actually get yeah. more they're deeper than they are trying to be wide. And it, so it felt really very real. So thank you very much for the oh book and for your response. Thank you. So Asako, if you're okay with this, because we started a bit late, could we end the conversation around in 15 minutes? So that'll put us at 8.15, would that be okay? Yeah, that's fine. I'm okay. just, I'm the one that's rambling, so. Oh, you're not rambling at all. <laughs> um, so while we wait for other questions, I actually had a follow-up, perhaps a follow-up uh, with regard to Shweta's question. Um, so you brought up this idea of global internationalism and science technology, and maybe some, perspectives are, are still not, that doesn't really grasp with science at large. And I say this because, um, you know, we have Dr. Wicka Wong uh, coming to give a book talk or and a discussion, I think November 23rd. And I'm pretty struck by how science is written by non-white people. Mm -hmm. There's kind of, Something of Waco Wong's chemistry alongside Alexandra Chong's Days of Destruction. So there's mm -hmm. kind of like Asian characters working in science fields or even just Silicon Valley. But yeah. your, your stories are more of like this, this global phenomenon that is science and technology in, 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 in war. So I, I sense a connection between groups impacted by science and technology. And so you and even Dr. Leah Ciaccarelli have brought up this kind of imagineness that science is without borders. But I consider actually that science is pretty Western, a Western construct, especially in kind of, if you think about the enlightenment period. Mm -hmm. So is science, is there like a Japanese science? Is there like a non-Western science? And how, how would that be even be written or even, clearly defined in a narrative that you're trying to tell us? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question because, you know, it's one of those situations where I don't know that, does it really go both ways? I think it, I think it probably does, you know? And I mean, you, you know, it, there are lots of local technologies and I don't mean local like in a town, but, you know, um, in the region, you know, um, depending on the environment and depending on the needs of the, of the, local, situ the local situation. Um, but I also think that, you know, certain kinds of technology is definitely given more power, you know, and in, in terms of the enlightenment, you know, it's one of those things where it's the, it's a flow of power, you know, um, where we're talking about like the flow of which way, this imperial um, force flows, you know? And so, for example, in Japan, um, there was this encounter with the West, but it's usually the West coming to Japan and having that encounter, you know, and, and Japan seeing the might, you know, um, the, the technology, the advance, you know, the, the advanced society of, of the West through this encounter because they're the ones that came, you know what I mean? And so I don't know if the narrative is already sort of formed at that point, you know, and so whatever is is done is kind of a response to it. On the other hand, though, I don't know because there's, it seems to me that there's a lot of movements these days to reclaim local technologies or reclaim so-called, you know, um, ancient or primitive or you know backward whatever technology or a pre-modern technology. Um, you know, whether it's in farming or whatever, you know. And so I don't know if these does that amount to like a different way of conceiving or um, writing about technology, you know, like 
um, I'm thinking specifically about this article I read where there were um, in Japan, I guess there are some farmers that are um, using these, uh, I guess they're ducks. I think they're ducks. Um, you know, there's like a flock of ducks to, to, to um, plant or to weed or something to do with like the rice paddies, you know, and, and it's really kind of helping. So they're trying to get away from certain types of farming by doing that, you know, and um, incorporating like natural like animals, you know, and, uh, and other things to do that. And I don't know if that will amount, does that amount to this other way of thinking about and talking about um, technology? I don't know, you know, I mean, do you, do you know? <laughs> Me on the spotlight. Um, well, my argument usually is that we have active participants, right? So we're, mm -hmm. maybe in our case, we're talking about Asians in STEM related fields, but I always want to flip the script and ask people, mm -hmm. could you imagine a science that isn't other? So you know, I'm thinking a lot about indigenous um, STS, yeah. like Kim Talbert and Zoe Todd. So they always were just saying, why don't you just not do the categorization, the binary? But when I bring it up, it's just because I think people take for granted science. You know, it's just science. It's, glow, it's like, like Dr. Leah. It's objectively, like, right. Yeah, it's like, it's free, it moves. But actually there are borders. And I don't mean like mm -hmm. prison, but like, if we think mm -hmm. about it critically, I think, you have to make one must come with a conclusion of some sort that it's, it can't be all inclusive if it's a very right. particular dominant singular minded kind of regime i think well that's a bad war <laughs> but you know it's just because even to this present day the discourse is you know follow the science or like um um what was it like what was it during like biden's political campaign it was always about the science becomes a character rather than just kind of mm -hmm. subject or um, a focus. Because I don't like, when, shouldn't we just say like all particular scientists? Because science, it can't just be everyone and every, but one particular group, you know? So. I mean, I think it definitely, you know, that that sort of language that's used around these things definitely create this sense of, as you said, like, you know, this, this objective reality type of thing as though there is, it just is for sure, you know, and I think that it, you know, what it does is it, it hides a lot of these dynamics and inequalities and all these other things that come with it, you know, and I think that that is one of its huge powers. Um, Matthew tells me he has a connected question to follow up. Okay. Okay. Always an echo of some sort. <laughs> so um, I'm curious about this idea of science traveling, knowledge traveling across contexts versus it being in some sense ordered. Um, I, th I found it, I didn't know this, I found it really interesting that the US granted an immunity to some of the researchers at, at the Ping Feng facility in exchange for the data. And I think the, the premise, I, I'm not, I haven't read much about this, but it seems like the premise is you can take the data, like separate it from its origins and take it somewhere else, presumably back to the US or to other imperial contexts that the US is involved in and use it as if it's not Japanese or it wasn't um, created in this Japanese Chinese uh, context. So I'm curious, can data travel? Do you think, what do you think this story says about the ability for knowledge to, to travel? Um, you know, was it othered in some sense and then reclaimed or was it always an imperial knowledge and, you know, it was part of this broader phenomenon? I mean, I think this is sort of interesting because does it travel and yet, I mean, it does travel and yet it doesn't seem to, I mean, there's so much about, you know, scientific data and scientific inventions or, or you know, they're, they're, they're patented, they're like part of these intellectual properties. Like, I feel like, you know, these are all bounded uh, knowledges, you know, and there, there's a transactional element, you know, within them. 
is it othered? I, you know, I don't know, but it's certainly um, reified, you know, especially in that context where the um, it's to circumvent the ethical questions around um, that particular medical science, you know, because it's really about human experimentation for the sake of science, you know, and um, the rationale is not, I mean, this is a kind of rationale that's used a lot in war, um, this idea of to save, you know, other people, to save lives, you do this, you know, so you, so you destroy lives to save your own lives or like that type of thing. And, um, but anyway, going back to the, um, in terms of like the science, uh, you know, it, it, it there's so much ethical questions that that surround it, and I think that this idea that 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 this knowledge is traveling, I don't know, travel. You know, it's it seems like such a neutral type of term, and I don't know that it's necessarily innocent. You know what I mean? Because it seems to me that if it only travels if there's a use for it in a way, or it's withheld, you know? And this puts me to mind this other thing that, that went on, which is that right after um, the, the war, during the American, or predominantly American, but, but allied occupation of Japan um, in Hiroshima, where the atomic bomb was dropped, um, there was uh, some kind of a no treatment policy that the American scientists and doctors had. And so even though they were there to study uh, the effects of radiation and the, the atomic blast on the um, victims, so the hibakusha, um, they, there was a no treatment policies and there was lots of different reasons for this. And, but it, again, it's, it's kind of unclear. You know, I don't think there's a clear reasoning except that it's implemented. And, you know, one of the biggest reasons was again, a, a, a sort of ethical type of question. You know, the reasoning being that if, um, the Americans treated these hibakusha, it's basically giving special treatment to a certain group of victims. And what this would mean is that, you know, they would then um, be admitting their guilt. You know, they're, they're, they'll be admitting that they have used a special weapon against a country. And this is, you know, in the background, what was raging was this debate of the, um, whether it was criminal or not for the US to have dropped the bomb. And so, you know, trying to circumvent uh, that whole question and circumvent the uh, accountability, um, that supposedly this was part of the, of the way that this was done, you know? And so, you know, withholding treatment, withholding um, medical advances, you know, like I know like penicil penicillin wasn't um, developed in, in Japan at the time yet, you know, but the US like had penicillin and I know that that wasn't necessarily, there was a debate about whether or not to release it into the Japanese market, despite the fact that it was in dire need at that time, you know? Um, so, but there's, there's such a complicated thing and, and there's so many ways to unpack this, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't know about the, the traveling component of this and, and, you know, how this intersects with issues of like ethical issues too, you know, cause I think there's always that ethical component um, to data information, things like that traveling, you know. And I think too, um, different countries have different kind of research guidelines and, uh, and yeah. like IRB, it's, not, it's like a very American thing. And then when you try to replicate an experiment from a country that doesn't have an R IRB or even maybe an equivalent to it, but it doesn't really match up. So even if science becomes a panacea, like I think it, it's more a question of power rather than kind of mm -hmm. like in a, or how would you say translating science? Like, I just don't think mm -hmm. that's, I, I can't even imagine how one would translate like the scientific method in terms of like the cultural nuances that each country and borders and regulations have. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if it's partly because, you know, so much of that has to do with, you know, asserting that, that sort of difference, you know, and, and power difference, because if you are to, um, if you are to test 
you know, um, for example, like in this case, you know, test a treatment method or something like that, you know, you have to it, it kind of assert that difference between the agent who is going to administer this thing versus like the object, you know, this the or the subject of the test, but really the object of it, right? The receiving end. Um, and so so and, and it works on that, right? I mean, it's it's not. I, I don't know if it's on the same continuum as like, you know, the, the need to kind of dehumanize other people in order to bomb them, for example, like that's why there's so much, you know, racist propaganda, you know, that goes along right before like, you know, an attack or something like that, you know, where a whole, if the whole country is demonized, then it gets easier to just aerial bomb them, for example, you know, um, and so I don't, I don't know, I don't know if it's because partially certain types of scientific and technological data that's, that's contingent on maybe, you know, having that sort of the difference, you know, um, asserted and maintained. I don't know if that's part of it. I don't know the answer to this, you know. <laughs> Funny that we're ending with. <laughs> On a terrible note. <laughs> well, not terrible, but maybe like a provocation for those who are do kind of do the work in these intersecting fields, maybe that's something to end your day, your night, or whatever time it is at on, on the, <laughs> the audiences. And um, I want to thank you, Asako, my former neighbor, for taking mm -hmm. the time and accepting the invitation to give such a great um, and thoughtful reading and then discussion afterward. And of course, oh, I kind. thank um, um, the artist who did the incredible artwork, Andrea Wen. And yeah. our live captioner, Julia, thank you oh so much. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so again, if you enjoyed this talk, um, you can expect a similar one in two weeks from now with Dr. Weiko Wong. Um, she will be giving a reading from chemistry and then um, kind of a future, or uh, a reading from an excerpt from her newest book. So that should be exciting too. And um, of course, Maybe the themes and the discussion here will also travel in the way that we <laughs> want it to travel. So thank you again all for attending and I hope you have a good night. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.